Good evening and welcome to part two of The Celtic Soul. I'm reading from an amazing book called Praying with, with Celtic Holy Women. Can you see that? Brilliant. And you can see the picture of a nun. Well, that is St. Bridget of Ireland. But let me read to you what the summary says on the back of this book. Part one of Praying with Celtic Holy Women discusses the theological underpinnings and origins of Celtic spirituality. Part two through part four narrate the legends and stories surrounding primary Celtic holy women of the fifth through to the eighth centuries. Reflecting especially on their pertinence to 21st century life. It is a beautiful book and it's certainly in keeping with my own Celtic Franciscan spirituality where we embrace the divine in the cathedral of life which is nature, the landscape. So reading from last night we continue the Celtic soul takes seriously the pronouncement of Jesus that those who do it to one of the least ones do it to me. A similar awareness is told in a legend of Bridget who gave away to the hungry a basket of apples given to her by a wealthy admirer. On being admonished for distributing a personal gift to the indigent Bridget's reply was, what is mine is theirs. And that really is the total, the sum total of being a Celtic Franciscan monk, a member of the Teo community. Because what is given to us is for sharing, not keeping for oneself. This is the world vision behind true Celtic hospitality. It is this value system that empowers our compassionate outreach in today's ministry of peace and justice. It enlivens the century's awareness of humanity as a global village for whose welfare each one of us is accountable. Part of this timeless, distanceless mentality is seen in the concept of thin places. For the Celtic soul, there are moments and places where the veil between present reality and the next world are so thin as to be nearly transparent. These are holy places, are holy monuments. These are thin places where one cannot help being drawn to awe-filled prayer in the presence of the holy. The Celtic soul sees a vision that can only be called faith eyes. A loved one is never removed, whether merely absent or with God since the Celtic life of faith lives more in God's ever-present time, Kairos, than in our chronological time, Kronos. Celtic spirituality is imbued with the sense of the family of God. The communion of saints as a spiritual bond connecting the living and the dead. The Irish way the tradition of accompanying the dead person on the journey into heaven reflects this view. When the grandfather of one of the authors, Patrick Beale, died, he was waked in his cottage where the family and friends gathered for an all-night vigil of storytelling, music, song, tears, food and lots of laughter. The next day, a large procession of family and neighbours accompanied Pat to the church for the liturgy and to the cemetery for Christian burial. In the Irish tradition, 
there is a Mass celebrated for the deceased one month after death, and it is common for family and friends to pray for a deceased loved one, for he or she is after all only a prayer away from us. In the theology behind Celtic spirituality, and contrary to Augustine's view of sin as a vitiating and evil disruption of original innocence, is the gentler insight that sees human beings as essentially God-centered. Insight, sorry, God-centered since the creating light of God dwells within all persons regardless of their faith beliefs. The divine light had been covered over and stifled by the inroads of sinful choices, but not extinguished. We are, as John's Gospel says, begotten by God's light, which is the light of humankind. The Celtic liturgical calendar is favoured with expressions from the Eastern Church. There are links with Syrian and Egyptian monasticism and the spirituality of the fathers and mothers of the desert. In the artwork of the Book of Kells and in the depiction of Saint Anthony of the Desert, in some of the high crosses, as well as in the beehive style structures that were the early monastic cells. The deserts of the East were mirrored in Ireland by the rocky isolation of the Burren or the Skelligs, those craggy mountains that push up off the coast of Kerry, or by the isolated islands such as Iona and Lindisfarne, and I have had the privilege of being to the two islands, Lindisfarne or Holy Island, off the Northumberland coast, the east, the northeast of the UK, and of course Iona, the west coast of Scotland, and both exceptionally beautiful and prayerful. Eastern style monastic asceticism has been popularized in the west by St. John Cassian whose influence is evident in Scotland, Ireland, Wales and Cornwall. The Celtic soul calls us to contemplate Earth's beauty and join in the dance of life, in celebrating the magnific magnificence all around us. The Celtic soul calls us to spend time outdoors where mountains stretch our minds and lakes and rivers refresh our spirits. In fact, the connection between water and spiritual power is a characteristic of Celtic spirituality. Lakes, rivers, springs. In fact, the connection between water and spiritual power is a characteristic of Celtic spirituality. Lakes, rivers, springs and wells are prominent in Celtic myths and associated with certain goddesses. In ancient times, women even went to holy wells to give birth. In Christian times, the Virgin Mary and several women saints, including Bridget, Ita, Gognaid, Monena, Dimpna, Non, Tegla, and Winifred are associated with springs, and water from these places is used in ritual and prayers for divine healing. Celtic holy wells continue to be healing sanctuaries and serve as reminders of the influence of pagan traditions on Christian practice. In our present-day evangelizing, evangelizing efforts, a growing awareness exists of the incorporation of indigenous rites, rituals and customs into Christian practice, where these can be adapted. 
we are realizing that those peoples to whom we are reaching out already have keenly developed spiritual insights regarding the power of the divine in their lives. For the same Holy Spirit draws and inspires every human being. Fortunately, in evangelizing the Celtic people in the early centuries of Christianity, the missionaries adapted all that was compatible with Christianity. That is why holy wells and their accompanying rituals are still common in Celtic spiritual practice. One of these holy sites, Lady Well, near Balankill in County Leeks, is still a popular pilgrimage site. Every year, from before anyone can remember, people from Leeks County gather at Ladywell to drink from and bathe in its waters, making a pilgrimage there, especially on August 15th, when a Mass is offered to celebrate the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mother into Heaven. The Ballyrone Brass Band plays and stories of cures and answers to prayers are retold. A Celtic heart is a pilgrim heart. Celtic saints often undertook a journey to what they termed their place of resurrection, usually a site far away, where they were to perform some good work and die there, stepping into eternity in exile from their earthly roots and homes. Such a pilgrimage to one's place of resurrection was usually a long journey, an arduous journey. Every pilgrimage, whether short or long, is an enactment of our own life's journey. It represents the yearning heart, longing for an encounter with God. It is more than a trip or tour because the pilgrim is seeking ardently for a meeting with the divine without knowing exactly what surprise is in store for them. The pilgrimage is actually a response to God's invitation to relinquish control, to step out and risk all without knowing the full consequences you could say it was a leap of faith. In Celtic tradition, the pilgrimage was far more rigorous than anything we might undertake today. The pilgrims set out often by sea to a totally unknown destination, believing that God was leading. It was always away from the familiar and the familiar was Ireland, so dear for its hearts and family ties. Ireland's landscape with its 40 shades of green, its brilliant rainbows, its starry nights, and air crisp freshness was dear to every pilgrim voyager who left with an awareness that there would most likely be no return. Such were the journeys of Colin Kill or Columba and Brendan, the navigator, and of the women, Aya to Cornwall, Melangal to Wales, Canera, Dimna and others who traveled to far off countries. For that matter, the, true, the same is true of Gognate, who traveled without settling anywhere until she would see nine white deer grazing together that sign would signal the site for the establishment of her monastery. And the place where she was to wait her own resurrection. The loose grasp of a faith journey in which the Christian allows God to be the captain of the ship and the guide of the traveler's steps is a mark central to the inner listenings of Celtic spirituality. Such drastic pilgrimages of those early saints were called white martyrdom. At the heart of Celtic women saints is a deep-rooted trust 
that life is good in joy and in grief alike. Now is the time for saintly, saintly women to arise from their neglected past and reveal for today's men and women the still pertinent message of their visionary lives and prophetic witness. And there we stop. And a lot of what I've shared with you resonates with my own heart. Though born in Glasgow and reared in Dublin from the age of three and leaving home at 16 in 1966, strange how that came about because I was engaged to a lovely girl, but I got this strong haunting premonition and it didn't leave me, it nagged me for three months that I was to leave home and go on a journey. And I never buy the Sunday papers in Dublin at that age, at 16. But this Sunday, I was guided to go to the paper stall at the church door. I picked up a paper and I'd seen vocations for nursing monks. I picked it up, I replied, and with no formal education, because I left school at 11 to rear a young family of seven while mom was in hospital for three years and my dad was self-employed as a butcher, it was natural that the eldest son or daughter would leave school and care for the siblings. So I had no education whatsoever, but I went in faith on a journey. And today I'm here in Cumbria in the ancient Celtic kingdom of Reggae. And the vow I made of enclosure means that when I said my goodbyes to all my students and clients that I'd worked with for over 12 years in Ireland from 2001, when I went self-employed, I said goodbye because I knew that the life I was guided to live and lead as the contemplative life, that my farewells to my motherland was there and then. So now my place of resurrection is here. And living the simple life as a Franciscan monk who embraces Celtic interfaith Franciscan spirituality is very different from the spirituality I embraced as a young Catholic nursing monk with all the dogma and ritual and fear and guilt. But the church has moved on. But sadly, a lot of my generation have been left with so much guilt and baggage that it's taken me 12 years in counseling, uh, not recently, but about 20 years ago, to fight off all the guilt and the baggage. But I love my church. But sadly, I don't think it loves me for the life I've chosen and where, in the words of Jesus and Francis, guided to embrace all faiths and to welcome all faiths into the Teo community of interfaith Franciscans and live the simple life where we give our life for unity and peace. And here, having read about the Celtic soul, it is a pilgrim heart. It is a heart infused with the love of the divine. And it is the heart that we nurture, because I believe the heart is your teacher. It is the gateway to your soul, and your soul is the gateway to God or Nirvana. So let us now kick off our shoes and come with me into the monastery garden. Here, it's tranquil, it's peaceful, it's in a sleepy village, surrounded by mountains and only a few minutes walk from the estuary. And I just want you to find a place in the garden. You may choose to sit under the beautiful cherry tree or maybe down by Mary's grotto. Or you may choose to sit beside Kuan Yin 
or Archangel Michael or even Saint Francis or maybe the Lord Buddha or Tara, the teardrop of the Buddha's eye. We have many Buddhas in the garden. It's an eclectic sacred garden. But just find a place where you feel comfortable and safe. And it's early morning. There's a crispness in the air and a slight dew on the grass. Be still now and be aware of the energies below your feet, the sacred healing energies from Mother Earth, the nature spirits, the tree divas and elementals. They're all around you now. So allow your senses to welcome the beauty in this cathedral of light. It is the beauty of God. It is the touch of God. As you breathe in now, be aware of the essence of all the beautiful fragrances in our garden. The herbs, the lavenders, and the beautiful roses. And with each in breath that you breathe in, you're breathing in a freshness for the spirit. And in your out breath, you are releasing to Gaia, Mother Earth, any tension, any tiredness or weariness, maybe unfulfilled dreams, or maybe some suppressed anger. And in your next in breaths, you breathe in the love of all that is sacred to you. in your out breath, you release a gratitude from the heart for the privilege of being here, surrounded by Mother Earth, the nature spirits, the tree divas and elementals, and Brother Sun, who's rising now and whose rays are piercing through the cherry tree surrounding you in a cocoon of love. Relax. Be aware of your feet, your bare feet resting on this sacred earth and this gentle energy from Gaia is flowing up through your feet and it now reaches your chakras, your tailbone. It reawakens your chakras, realigns them so that you can receive balance and harmony, facilitating that divine connectedness. And you are aware of that subtle, gentle energy as it flows up your legs, through your pelvic girdle and abdomen into your chest and it now circulates your heart the gateway to your soul the gateway to your God goodness and as you sit here you become aware that you are loved that you are loved that you are sacred that you are divine. Be still now and allow yourself to receive, to receive the blessings of the divine. And as you look across the sacred garden, you become aware of sound, of the birds singing, and it fills you with joy. It's a coming home for you. The pilgrim heart has come home. 
be at peace in that heart and allow the love of Mother Earth, Kuan Yin, Magdalena and Mother Mary, together with all the great ascended masters and the great spiritual teachers, the Lord Buddha, Vishnu, Ganesh, Krishna, Paramahanda, Yogananda, Rumi, Osho, Shri Chimoy, Allow their love touch you now. And you see before you, through the mist on the grass, you see footprints, footprints on the dew, energetic footprints. And there's an inner voice guiding you to walk in those footprints and leave your energetic footprint when you come to leave the monastery garden. But first, you become aware of a presence by you. It is your guardian angel assigned to you from the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb. And your guardian angel is with you now, prompting you to use your gift of free will to ask for the help that you now need. So ask. Ask of your guardian angel for the specific help or support that you now need. Take your time and share it from your heart. Allow your heart convey what you are really feeling deep within your being. And as you share, you become aware of releasing love, releasing joy to the world, releasing tensions and stress that's been deeply buried, now coming to the surface and being released. And your guardian angel takes you by the hand and holds your hand and you feel and sense in your being that you have felt this hand before in your life's journey. When you hit those difficult times, when you felt you were alone, but you become aware that you were never alone. It was your guardian angel. And they're here now. And they've taken you by the hand and they're encouraging you never to let go but to trust to trust with a childlike trust and to breathe in the very breath of your god goddess so let us take that in breath again as we breathe in, we hold it, and now we breathe out. And be aware of a shift of consciousness. You're becoming lighter, with clarity. And you breathe in again, and hold it. And as you breathe out again, you become aware of that inner peace. It is a gentle peace. It is a peace of God for you. 
and your guardian angels inviting you to relax in this peace and to just be yourself, to stop pretending, to stop pretending to be someone you're not and discourages you from being a victim or a rescuer. You sense in your heart a deep awareness to take back your power now from situations that have almost destroyed you, from individuals who may have hurt you deeply, to take back your power from those negative experiences and allow them be infused by the Celtic soul of the pilgrim heart seeking nirvana. Sit now and allow your guardian angel to touch you with the healing touch of the I am presence of God. you feel that you have a purpose and a meaning for life. You become aware in the very fibers of your being that you are a pilgrim heart, that you are on a journey, a journey through the cathedral of God the landscape and those that accompany you here are the animals who only represent love. There are no human beings in this journey but you and God with your guardian angel and all your beautiful pets and friends. Be guided by Brother Sun and Sister Moon. And now allow the angel of joy touch you and fill you with love in this angel peace garden here at our monastery. And relax. Relax because you are in the arms of God and you are loved. Be still. Be still now. And you can say the mantra of your own choosing or you may choose to use this mantra. I am a child of the divine. I am love divine. I am whole, I am perfect. I am complete in this oasis of love. I am a child of God. Relax. 
be still and reawaken your heart now to the I am presence of God and when you feel ready gently open your eyes and look around you what do you see what are you feeling and sensing in your being at this hour Embrace it, because it's your free gift from a loving God. And as we bring our time together to a close, I want to share with you a fourfold Franciscan blessing. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers half-truths and superficial relationships so that you may seek truth boldly and love deeply within your heart. May God bless you with a holy anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that you may tirelessly work for justice freedom and peace among all people. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed with those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish, so that they may reach out your hand to comfort them and transform their pain to joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference. A difference in this world so that you may be able with God's grace to do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God the Supreme Majesty and our Creator, and to Jesus the Cosmic Christ, our brother, our teacher, our mentor, and our friend, who with the Holy Spirit, our advocate and guide, be with you at this time and remain with you each day of your life. And with each in-breath you breathe in the Celtic soul as a pilgrim seeking divine oneness. Be at peace. Become that peace. For you've been called to be an ambassador of peace. And that's what being an interfaith Franciscan is all about. We embrace Celtic spirituality. And we embrace God, the Divine One, in all of creation. And the animal kingdom are our friends. Good night and God bless you. And thank you for being here for part two of the Celtic Soul. Sleep well. Namaste, shalom, inshallah, paxat bonum om shanti, solo di caritas, salam alaikum, peace. God bless you. Praise you, God. We praise your name. All for your glory.